to this. I've, I think I have imposter syndrome because partly because I'm probably going to talk more about natural selection than <laughs> sexual selection, or at least the mechanisms behind uh, sexual selection. Um, I've been working on uh, pollen competition in a comparative context for quite a while. Mostly I've been trying to reconstruct aspects of early angiosperm evolution and the playing field that pollen competition occurs in, um, hopefully to get at the direction of pollen competition, what, what pollen competition might have had consequences, might have been for uh, gametophyte evolution. And, oh, it's, it's uh, this way, yeah. Um, this way, yeah. So I, I thought I'd start with this quote, which most of you probably already know. Uh, a gene that greatly accelerates pollen tube growth will spread even if it causes disadvantages for the, the, the adult plant or sporophyte. So I put this in here because I, I like that Haldane recognized early uh, um, that, um, that gametophytes and sporophytes have semi-independent evolutionary trajectories. They clearly influence each other, but they are um, independent uh, they have an independent morphology and evolution. Um, and in the 70s, when sexual selection began to be applied to plants, um, the focus was necessarily on sporophytes. So pollen competition being a mechanism for generating changes in sporophytes. And Mulcahy perhaps did one of the only comparative studies at the time, or even since, uh, on pollen competition. And it was more of a hypothesis than a, than a, a test. But he proposed, really, that pollen competition has been important for sporophyte evolution, that it's driven the speed of sporophyte evolution, the morphological evolution of sporophytes, and species diversification at the sporophyte level. Um, and since then, there's been lots of studies of pollen competition, not too many comparative studies. Um, and there have been mixed results uh, summarized, maybe by at least two recent papers, one saying pollen competition hasn't been that important at least for early seedling traits, and another saying that pollen competition has been really important. Um, but again, for, for sporophytes. Um, so what about gametophyte evolution? You know, uh, David Mocha, he studied uh, pollen tube growth for his whole career, and I don't think he ever reported a pollen tube growth rate in any, any of his studies. So as a comparative biologist, I need to know what the traits are. And so I've been thinking about what the traits are and how gametophytes evolve. Um, surely they might have an effect on sporophytes or not, but what about gametophyte evolution? And that seems silly because people have studied evolutions for, of gametophytes for years. And not only gametophyte diversity and form and morphology, but also performance of gametophytes. We know, for example, mosses have different ecological strategies um, than, than other kinds of plants, and competition is being taken into account in these kinds of studies. We don't have a comparable literature for gametophytes, and once you get to seed plants, it, it just disappears. You don't know anything about gametophytes. Uh, so um, pollen competition involves differential development and growth of, of gametophytes. And um, what are the evolutionary developmental mechanisms that enhance uh, the evolution of performance or inhibit it? Um, so here's a likely ancestral developmental pattern of angiosperms uh, pollen. Pollen gets initiated by sporogenous tissue in an anther. It develops to the bicellular stage, um, at which time it usually undergoes dehydration. And as the pollen becomes dehydrated, at some point um, it gets dispersed. And then there's the so-called free-living stage where it lives uh, in a dormant state uh, as it gets dispersed. And then when it lands on a stigma, it, it undergoes a process of germination, which largely involves a process of uh, rehydration and then the mobilization of the metabolic machinery, the restarting of the metabolic machinery. And then it becomes a living organism again. Um, pollen tube growth happens, uh, the, the development of the sperm cells happens, and then eventually uh, fertilization happens. And we know that um, all gymnosperms and 70% of flowering plants have sexually immature pollen that disperse. They disperse sexually immature pollen in angiosperms, we call that bicellular pollen because there's a generative cell here along with the tube nucleus of that single cell uh, organism, well, bicelled organism. Um, and that, that uh, sperm precursor cell then divides to form two sperm in 30% of angiosperms, always in a derived uh, condition. As Brubaker in 1969 showed really eloquently in one of the first evolutionary developmental comparative studies. 
But we redid Brubaker's study uh, with a lot more species and pretty much found the same result that he had with, without um, having these great phylogenies and, and methods and whatnot. But the bisider state is the most likely ancestral state for angiosperms. Um, but bisider pollen has a lot of other things associated with it, and one is water content. Um, bisider pollen, pollen is often, well, pollen in general is often dehydrated when it's dis dispersed. We used to think all pollen is dehydrated when it's dispersed. And the problem is it's hard to measure water content in pollen unless you have a lab available because uh, it's such a tiny organism. But we developed a method to do this in the field where you can just take pollen from an anther um, and you can uh, put, uh, you can dry some of it in, a, in an oven or on a herbarium sheet or whatever. Um, you can put the fresh pollen in oil to get the, the size at dispersal and you can hydrate the pollen in water to get the hydrated size. And then you can tell what the fresh size is relative to its, its uh, minimum possible size and maximum possible size. And that gives you a, a sense of like how much water was in that pollen when it was dispersed. In this case, 43%, it's a fairly hydrated pollen grain actually because uh, all pollen is gonna hydrate, even pollen that has high water content is still gonna hydrate a little more. Um, so I looked at the, a lot of these early angiosperm lineages like Amborella and the water lilies, Australiales and whatnot. Uh, to see what, what they were. They're, they're almost all dehydrated. Their sizes in blue here are all below 30% or so um, hydration index. There are a couple of ones that are hydrated, uh, and these happen to be wind pollinated species, interestingly enough. And then recently we looked at uh, an old hypothesis that tricellular pollen really should be hydrated. Uh, when you look at tricellular pollen, uh, physiologists look at it, it tends to be metabolically active and that means it's probably hydrated. You can't be metabolically active if you're uh, in a dehydrated state. Um, and that turned out to be true. Uh, we had to control for uh, pollen volume because uh, hydrated pollen tends to be larger than dehydrated pollen. So that, that was significant as well. Um, most people report uh, pollen water status uh, just at a gross level, either more or less hydrated at dispersal, like corn pollen, uh, or more or less dehydrated at dispersal. You can tell just by the morphology of the pollen grain if it's hydrated or not. Um, and when you look at the literature, um, the vast majority of pollen uh, species have bicellular pollen that's dehydrated uh, or tricellular pollen um, that's hydrated. So this is sort of expected. Um, tricellular or hydrated pollen is the most overrepresented state. Um, I'm not gonna go through this complicated slide, but this is the, the ancestral pattern. We think bicellular dehydrated. There are lots of different developmental mechanisms for getting, to, for evolving tricellular pollen, and it's a more or less irreversible state once you get there. So one way is just to keep pollen dehydrate, uh, dehydration, but accelerate your pollen, your cell cycle, to get to the tricellular stage before pollen dehydration takes, occurs. Another, a uh, way to get there is by a two-step process. First, you lose pollen dehydration. Once you disperse pollen in a hydrated state, you're metabolically active, and so your cell cycle is going, and the clock is ticking, and so um, you can reach the tricellular state before you disperse the pollen. That happens. It's probably the most common way for getting tricellular pollen. Um, there are functional consequences to being hydrated or not. Um, dehydrated pollen um, takes longer to germinate. Um, and there's a lot more variability in germination rate, uh, germination speed, I should say. Um, hydrated pollen, on the other hand, usually has a curve that looks uh, kind of like this. Um, I've only studied bicellular pollen in my life, more or less. Um, but uh, pollen germinates simultaneously really fast, um, and you get maximum pollen germination within a very short period of time. So very different trajectory. So um, when you look at the life history of the sporophytes, the time between pollination and fertilization is basically the reproductive cycle. Um, and it's interesting that uh, most taxa with tricellular pollen grains have very, very short times between pollination and fertilization. So these are species that have evolved into really rapid reproductive cycles. And uh, species that have really long programmatic phases from three days, a week, a month, all the way up to a year or even more than a year tend to be bicellular or se dispersed sexually immature pollen. Um, just to show you, uh, 
I've taken averages here, averaging over gen, uh, species within genera first, and um, with 96 genera and 46, uh, 48 genera, uh, bicellular pollen germinates uh, at a much slower speed than tricellular pollen. Um, so um, that's, that's something that people have observed before, but it really is true now, let's uh, see. Um, but it's probably water content that's really driving that. And interestingly, um, Arabidopsis uh, is bicellular, but it's dehydrated. I mean tricellular, but it's dehydrated. Uh, so it doesn't have 8.5 minutes germination. It's, it's got slow germination. So it really is um, water content that's driving a lot of this. But going back to this figure, it's interesting why there are no tricellular species in uh, organisms with really long uh, re reproductive life histories. Um, there ought to be. If pollen competition is ruling the world like we think it is in this room, um, you should see tricellular pollen competitive phenotypes evolving in all these groups, but you don't. And why is that? Um, well, probably because there is a macroevolutionary trade-off between uh, things that determine competitive ability, like water content, uh, sexual maturity, metab metabolic activity. Um, you, when you have really uh, high water content and metabolic activity, you tend to have a short uh, lifespan. And so the duration of pollen dispersal, pollen ecology is really driving this uh, trade-off here. Um, it really is a trade-off between pollen longevity and pollen competitive ability that um, is probably driving this pattern. So I've talked about pollen germination um, for a lot of the time, but actually pollen germination only takes up a little bit of the time um, between three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So uh, it only takes up 5% of this programmatic phase between pollination and fertilization. So pollen tube growth is what we really should be interested in. Um, and uh, I've shown previously that angiosperm pollen tubes developmentally have, have developed really fast growth rates. Um, but other things that have that same kind of pattern of tip growth have not been able to do that. And that could be a developmental constraint associated with the pollen tube wall. Um, gymnosperm pollen tubes have very slow growth rates and angiosperms have far exceeded those rates. So we've done a, a phylogenetic perspective on pollen tube growth rates. Um, and just to summarize real quick, uh, we rejected grounding motion and random models for the evolution of pollen tube growth rate. It's really an OU process uh, that pollen tube growth rate evolves under, which is a stabilizing selection-like effect. You get less variation accumulating over time than you'd expect over Brownian, in a Brownian motion way. In other words, you don't see closely related species having really different pollen tube growth rates. Um, the angiosperm, uh, angiosperms are evolving around a much faster optimum than gymnosperms, uh, a lot faster. And there are lots of speed ups and uh, slowdowns. So under the, if you think pollen competition rules the world, we ought to see faster growth rates in everybody. We should have directional selection for, for fast growth rate. But um, you do see the accumulation of faster rates, but you also see lots of slowdowns. Um, in fact, more slowdowns than speed ups if you um, use uh, some of these new techniques. So, uh, delayed fertilization, I just want to quickly touch on that because the long programmatic phases are evidence of delayed fertilization. It's a topic that Mary Wilson visited a lot. It's a, it's a mechanism for accumulating more pollen and intensifying competition. Um, but uh, is fertilization really delayed? And gymnosperms, no. Uh, gymnosperms probably have ancestrally long programming phases. That's not delay of fertilization. In fact, they probably accelerated the time they have between uh, pollination and fertilization. Uh, within angiosperms, you have groups that have evolved true delayed fertilization, where you've elongated the, pollen, the time between pollination and fertilization. Um, and these groups, like orchids and oaks, are, are generally pollen-limited groups. They, have, they evolve along this uh, line here where they have uh, the pollen to egg ratio is probably around one, um, or even below it in some cases. Um, and that's the, in orchids, the pollen is also closely related, so that minimizes competition. In uh, oaks and birches and gymnosperms, you have sequential pollen arrival on this stigma, so really not conditions for strong pollen competition. And finally, I'm getting to my last slide. Um, when you look at pollen tube growth rate against the duration of uh, time between pollination and fertilization, you get this negative relationship. Um, things that have uh, fast pollen tube growth rates have really uh, short time.
time to fertilization, and vice versa. Um, and again, that gets to that trade-off that we have between performance ability, competitive ability, and longevity of the pollen that has to last for a long time. So uh, there are repeated parallel origins of both fast and slow pollen performances. We've got slow lineages and fast lineages. There's lots of room there for people to do studies um, in lineages that have experienced long-term weak pollen competition or strong pollen competition. Um, and again, like I said, there's lots of evidence for natural selection. Um, but hopefully you guys can apply that back to sporophytes for me. <laughs> and thanks to my graduate student, John Rees. He's looking for a teaching job if anybody uh, knows of one. Um, and my great undergraduates. Thanks. Sure.